At this point, we've talked about activating the fatty acid by ligating it to a coenzyme A. We've talked about transport of said fatty acid into the mitochondria. Now we're in the mitochondrial matrix, and we can now discuss beta oxidation. So beta oxidation is named because it's the beta carbon of the fatty acid that's actually going to be oxidized. So before we go into the enzymes and all that stuff, let's talk about a little bit of the nomenclature of the fatty acid. Okay, we can see over here we have a thioester group. So this carbon we don't label with any of these Greek symbols. Okay? But if we look at the carbon adjacent to this carbon, or carbonyl right here, part of the thioester, this carbon is the alpha carbon. Okay? This is not oxidized specifically in beta oxidation. It's the beta carbon, which is adjacent to the alpha carbon, that is oxidized. So starting at this carbonyl carbon, we go alpha and then beta. And then these ones out here are pretty much irrelevant for this. Um, it is worth noting that the terminal carbon, regardless of what number it is, is called the omega carbon. That'll come to play when we discuss omega oxidation. But for example, we're going to look at this 12 carbon fatty acid and see how it undergoes beta oxidation. Now in beta oxidation, there are four enzymes, at least when we're talking about saturated fatty acids. So when we have a saturated fatty acid with an even number of carbon atoms, so 12, and this is saturated, it will simply undergo these four reactions in a cycle over and over and over again. And each cycle will reduce the number of carbon atoms by two. So at the end of every cycle, we should be getting acetyl-CoA. But it's just going to be these four enzymes repeated over and over again. All right, let's look at the first one. The first one is called fatty acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. Sometimes you'll see it just with the uh, acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. This enzyme is going to create a double bond between the alpha and beta position. Okay, So we see that double bond right here. The electrons have to be removed from the fatty acid between alpha and beta, and they go to FAD. And so in the process of oxidizing this single bond into a double bond, we end up converting FAD into FADH2. And we should know that this FADH2 will then transfer its electrons uh, to some of the electron transport chain proteins, and that will allow us to produce energy in the mitochondria. Okay? So this FADH2 is one of our reduced electron carriers. Okay? Also notice that this double bond that's put in is a trans double bond. It's very important to realize that when you do this reaction, you are not generating a cis double bond. This is a trans double bond always. Okay. Now, the second reaction is catalyzed by enoyl coa hydratase. Okay. So in this reaction, we're going to use water. And the water is going to be added across this double bond, but it's going to be added at the beta position. So notice when the water attacks this beta carbon, we're going to end up with an OH group on the beta carbon. Okay? So it's called a hydratase because we have hydrated the beta carbon. Okay? Now the double bond is gone, but we've essentially oxidized the beta carbon now, thus the name beta oxidation. So this gives us what we call a beta hydroxyacyl CoA. It's called a beta hydroxyacyl CoA because we have a CoA, and it's a beta hydroxy because we have a hydroxyl group on the beta carbon. All right. Now the third reaction here is catalyzed by beta hydroxyacyl CoA dehydrogenase. Now. It's a fancy term for just saying that we're going to oxidize this OH group into a carbonyl. Okay? So what happens here is this OH gets oxidized into a double bond to an oxygen. That is a ketone right here. And the electrons from the hydroxyl group right here have to go somewhere, so they go to NAD. And so in the process, NAD gets converted to NADH. And we hopefully know what happens to NADH. It's going to also go into the electron transport chain, but it's going to fuel complex 1. Okay? So it's going to fuel a different protein than this FADH2 from the first step. But in any case, this is going to provide us electrons for the electron transport chain. This is a reduced coenzyme. All right? Now the fourth enzyme, sometimes it'll just be referred to as thiolase, but the full name is beta-ketoacyl-CoA thiolase. Okay. What it's going to do is it's going to split this bond right here between the alpha and the beta position. Okay. And there's a few other things I want to go over before we look at this step in detail. 
First of all, notice that we still have 12 carbons here in this fatty acid. So we haven't at this point changed the number of carbons. All we've done is oxidize the beta position. Now, if I split this bond right here, okay, if we look at the carbons to the right, we just have this carbon and this carbon. So I would expect to lose two carbon atoms, right? So I would take 12 carbons and get down to 10. So that's what I'm expecting to happen. So this coenzyme A is going to attack this position right here, and through an acyl substitution mechanism, it's going to cleave this bond between the alpha and the beta carbon. Now that's going to do two things. One, if we lose these two carbons right here, that means we're just going to get off an acetyl-CoA. So with each round of beta oxidation, we're going to get a molecule of acetyl-CoA. So that's important. And this acetyl-CoA can then go and fuel the citric acid cycle. But the other thing is, if we're losing all this over here, we now have a shortened acyl-CoA. So we still have this, this CoA right here because this CoA attacked this position right here. So we still have a CoA on here, but we've shortened it by two carbons. So if we shorten it by two carbons by getting rid of acetyl-CoA, we now should have 10 because we started with 12. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. So that's what's going to happen in every single round of beta oxidation. The final thing here to notice is that the alpha and beta positions have now sort of changed. Okay? Um, they're the same in the sense that the alpha position is always the position adjacent to the carbonyl. Okay? So the alpha position is always adjacent to that, and the beta position is next to that. So every time in this last step by thiolase that we cleave off the acetyl-CoA, we reestablish a new alpha and beta position. Okay, So hopefully that makes sense. So if we have a saturated fatty acid with an even number of carbon atoms, which is the, by far the most common, we're just going to repeat these four steps over and over. So here's a, a schematic of starting with our 12 carbons of what's going to happen every time. Okay. This thing over here on the top left we just saw. We went from 12 carbons down to a 10 carbon fatty acid and we generated an acetyl-CoA. Okay. But see, this 10 carbon fatty acid that now has a CoA on it is just going to come back over here and undergo the same four reactions again. Now if I start with 10 carbons, if I lose two more, I'll generate that acetyl-CoA. That's the two carbons, but then I now shorten the 10 carbons by two, so now I should have an 8 carbon fatty acid. Okay. And then this 8 carbon fatty acyl-CoA is going to come back over here and undergo beta oxidation again. And so each time we undergo beta oxidation, we call that a round of beta oxidation. So here's our first round of beta oxidation. The product comes over here, undergoes a second round of beta oxidation. This product comes over here, undergoes a third round. And you're going to keep undergoing beta oxidation until you can't do beta oxidation anymore. And the point that you can't do it is when you're down to two carbons, okay? which basically means you're down to acetyl-CoA. So let's look down here. We just generated a six carbon fatty acid. It's going to undergo a round of beta oxidation. It's going to be shortened by two carbons. We're going to get out an acetyl-CoA here. And now we have a four carbon fatty acyl-CoA went from 6 to 4. Now this 4 carbon fatty acyl-CoA is going to come over here, okay, and it's going to undergo the final round. But well, why is it the final round if it has 4 carbons? Because when it undergoes a round of beta oxidation here, which is actually the fifth round, when you split this up, you're going to get off two carbons, so here's an acetyl-CoA, but you're going to have just two carbons left, but that's just acetyl-CoA. You can't do beta oxidation on acetyl-CoA anymore. So in the end, if we want to figure out the number of rounds of beta oxidation for a given fatty acid, we just take the number of carbon atoms and divide by two, and we always subtract one. So this fatty acid had 12 carbons. So 12 over 2 is 6, minus 1 is 5. So even though there's 12 carbons and half of that is 6, we actually only need 5 rounds of beta oxidation. Let's think about it. Here's the first round, here's the second, here's the third, the fourth, and then here's the fifth. The fifth round of beta oxidation always produces two acetyl-CoAs because when you split that four carbon uh, fatty acid, you end up with two acetyl-CoAs, so you don't need a sixth round. Okay? 
The other thing we can ask is how many NADHs did we produce? Well, for saturated fatty acids, the number of NADHs produced is always equal to the number of rounds of beta oxidation. So if we had five rounds of beta oxidation, we have five NADH that's produced. Because remember, if we look at the pathway, the third enzyme produces NADH. So for every round of this, we're going to have one NADH produced. Okay. The same thing's true of FADH2. The number of FADH2s I'm going to get out of beta oxidation is going to be equal to the number of rounds of beta oxidation. Okay? Because the first step here is where I get that FADH2. So each round of this, I should get one FADH2. Five rounds of beta oxidation, five FADH2s. Now, what about the number of acetyl-CoA's? This is always equal to just half of the number of carbons. So if I have a 12 carbon fatty acid, I should be getting out six acetyl-CoA's. And I went ahead and boxed them to prove it to you. So I get one from the first round, one from the second round, one from the third round, one from the fourth round, but always for even number of carbon atoms, I get two from the last round. Okay? So even though I only have five rounds of beta oxidation, because when I split that four carbon fatty acid, I'm going to get two molecules of acetyl-CoA. I should really put a two carbon right here. Okay? Um, and so I get six total acetyl-CoA's. Right? And so you can use these formulas, or just some logic here, to figure out the yield for every single fatty acid. So for example, if you had, let's say, an 18 carbon fatty acid, how many rounds of beta oxidation would it require? And let's assume that it's saturated. Well, if it's 18 carbons, 18 over 2 is 9, minus 1 is 8. Okay? So in order to catabolize completely an 18 carbon saturated fatty acid, you'd need 8 rounds of beta oxidation, because it's 1 less than half. Also, you'd produce 8 NADHs and 8 FADH2s. However, from an 18 carbon fatty acid, you would get 9 acetyl-CoA's. Okay, so hopefully this process makes sense to you. Now for most biochemistry courses, you would need to memorize these four enzymes and know which ones produce FADH2 and NADH. And also note that acetyl-CoA is produced in the last step. But what's important to understand is that this process is very repetitive. It's just going to repeat itself over and over and over again. So the product of one round of beta oxidation is going to be the start point for the next round. Okay, and with saturated fatty acids that have an even number of carbon atoms, the last step is always going to give you two acetyl CoA's. All right. In the next video, we're going to discuss what happens when you have an unsaturated fatty acid, and then after that, we'll discuss what happens when you have an odd number of carbon atoms. Okay, we're going to see some modifications to both of those pathways. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.